Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house. Let's all stand together. It's Christmas season. From Thanksgiving to Christmas, we'll be focusing on some Christmas songs. And what better way to start than by singing joy to the world. house with you again today. We hope everyone has had a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, week and has recuperated well enough to be able to worship the Lord together today. It'll test our singing. If our if our bellies are too big, we may not be able to sing very well today, Barry. Okay, so you have to take a big deep breath and, uh, and be able to sing today. I know we had a great week and I hope you did as well, worshiping uh, the Lord and fellowshipping with our families. I'd like to begin our worship today uh, by reading a passage of scripture out of Ephesians in the sixth chapter. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Let us pray. Lord, we pray today that we would be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we would be fruitful in the work that you've given us together to do. God, we pray today that we would be faithful to stand. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful to us in every circumstance, that we would be aware that we have an adversary. He is a schemer and a trickster, and Lord, he would try to trip us up. But Lord, we thank you that greater is he who is in us. Lord, thank you that you are in us than the one that is in the world. And God, we thank you that we are not designed to be victims but to be victors and to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Thank you for this day that we can come and to gather and to worship you. And God, we thank you for those who are at home. We thank you for those who are in the parking lot today and those who are in this building. And God, that no matter where we are, that we would be gathered for the purpose of worship. And Lord, that we'd be unified in that as you, through your Holy Spirit, draw us together for one purpose, and that is to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
favorite songs of the Christmas season is Go Tell It on the Mountain. Wherever we are and whatever position of life we're in, we can tell of the love of Jesus. yesterday to uh, sing a song that I know most all of us love, I'll Fly Away. Our hope in Jesus is not just seasonal for Thanksgiving or Christmas, but it's eternal. I'll Fly Away. singing that this morning. We're going to slow it down a notch or two. We're going to sing 10,000 Reasons and a chorus that goes with it. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's sing this out to the Lord. We have so many things to be thankful for, and uh, let's don't limit it to just a season or a day of the year.
Amen. I pray you have not run out of reasons to worship the Lord this morning. It is great to be in God's house and to be able to worship Him together. I'll invite you, if you have your Bibles, to be readying yourself for our scripture reading in a few moments from Matthew 13. Before we do that, I will remind you that this as a part of Thanksgiving and Christmas is a part of our mission season. I used to say that many, many years ago, but it's kind of like every season of the year now. Thankfully, at our church is mission season. We have something we are emphasizing year-round as a special opportunity. And right now, that special opportunity is through the International Mission Board and the uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering as an emphasis for that for international missions. Now, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, we had a very specific way that we kind of focused on that, and we had some guests with us, and they shared their work in East Asia and how we can be a part of that in prayer. And last week, Brother Heath, Sister Margaret had some prayer guides. I think we still have some of those prayer guides. If you want to pray year-round specifically for international missionaries and missions in East Asia, if you'll just see them, they're here today, and uh, they will get those to you as a year-round prayer emphasis. But during the month of December for our offering, we have some other prayer guides, and these are just short-term and, and help you focus on the Lottie Moon Christmas offering uh, for international missions. We don't give to the offering, we give through it, and it helps do missions around the world in many places, including East Asia and others. And so if you'll take a prayer guide, pray, read, study, meditate on that, and then also take an offering envelope, and these are here on the front table, also in the foyer where you come in. And I encourage you to put this in a really prominent place, okay, whether that prominent place is in your Bible, hopefully you read your Bible regularly and you can use it as a bookmark, uh, you can put it on the refrigerator, for some of us that may be a more prominent place right there where we go to get all those snacks and meals, maybe where we eat, maybe we're prone to sit down and watch television, you might put it right there and remind yourself to pray and to participate in giving. Uh, another way we can participate in giving is through the angel tree, we started that last week and we've had great success once again. There are, I can see from where I stand, three angels, unless there's some hiding on the other side, but approximately three angels are still remaining. And if you feel led to take one of those this morning, or if you're at home and, or in the parking lot, if you'll communicate with us somehow, we can get you an angel. And uh, there's a login sheet. Don't forget, um, Haley walked up as we were beginning, and she was uh, whispering, do I log it down right here? I said, yeah, write it right here. And so she picked up some angels and wrote those down. And so it's not that difficult uh, to do. Remember, each angel represents about a $35 commitment to give. Keep the angel with the gifts when you bring them back. And uh, the week before Christmas, we will take those and deliver them. And we need help with that too. And that's one of the most exciting parts of this project is being on the end of being a delivery person. And you get to pray and to share the love of Jesus with moms and dads and grandparents and people who are uh, going through difficult times sometimes. The children represented on this tree are most always children that are currently being ministered to in and through our church, a part of our church body here. So generally these are not strangers. Uh, these are people that we know and love and care for, and they appreciate uh, that involvement. And so uh, through all the ways that we can, let's participate together. And one of the ways that we participate in getting ready for Christmas is through an Advent wreath. And this morning, we're going to light the first candle of our Advent wreath as we think about uh, the idea of a promise, okay? Now, most of you, if you didn't grow up around Advent, you may not be familiar with what this tradition is or holds. Historians as far back as three or 400 years after the Bible was written can point to the church celebrating a season of Advent, a time of thinking about the coming of Jesus. Okay, that's what the word Advent means, is coming. And that Jesus came. And that he, he came to the earth, uh, and it wasn't really a surprise. Now, it kind of surprised the people that were there, in a sense, but if we go to the scriptures, and if you have your Bible, I already told you to turn to Matthew, but if you, you want to turn with me to Isaiah, or if you can just listen, either one, I promise not to misread it. Isaiah 9 foretells of a promise of someone who would come. Has someone ever said, hey, I'll be at your house later and never showed up? Has someone ever said, I'm going to give you a gift and never 
came through with the gift. Well, we hear of a, a promise made in Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order and to establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We've probably had people promise us things that didn't come through. But the good news about Christmas is that we have a promise that Jesus will fu fulfill. <laughs> he has fulfilled it, and he is fulfilling it right now. That Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever is the God of Christmas. Christmas is his birthday, and he promised the people of Israel in Isaiah that he would come. And if you notice when you read that, there's kind of a mixture of tenses. If we were in a composition class in high school, maybe they would mark us down because we didn't keep our tenses all the same. He says, unto us is born, and then it says he will be born. All at the same time, so, well, is Jesus an is or is he a will be? Or is he a was? Well, the answer to that really is yes. <laughs> He's all places and all the time. And so as he promises us things, one of the reasons we know he will fulfill his promises is because he's God. And he is not limited the way we are by time and space. Sometimes we are very careful to say, well, if, if I can, I will. Or if it's possible, I will. Because we don't always know in our ability. But when Jesus made a promise... He knew he could keep it. He knew he would keep it. And in a sense, he already knew he did keep it. <laughs> he said he would come. We're going to talk again today about his kingdom, but he prophesied that his kingdom would come. Now, as we think about Advent, we'll write, light a candle each week. And we're going to have an increasingly brighter light as we get close to Jesus' birthday, of our celebration of Jesus' birthday. Kind of like a birthday cake. Some of y'all have lived long enough, you got an inferno on your cake these years now. Lots of flames, lots of candles. We're going to have one each week, and then on Christmas Eve, we'll light the Christ candle. And we're looking forward to that as we build anticipation towards celebrating Jesus' birthday. Now, as I mentioned, this has been going on in the history of the church, we know, since three or four, five hundred years at least after Jesus lived and died and rose again. And one of the things that I found out this week in studying a little bit more about Advent was Traditionally, during Advent, many, many, many hundreds of years ago, people would fast during Advent. Now, take a big, deep breath and relax. I'm not going to tell you you have to fast during Advent. Some of y'all are laughing. You know, you're like, no, there's no way he's going to ask us to do that. wouldn't be a bad idea between the Feast of Thanksgiving and the Feast of Christmas, but to have a time of fasting, and we're not legalistic about that, but fasting helps us focus. To do without something might not hurt all of us. And one of the things that I hear, especially when we start by saying it's mission season and we can give more and pray more, oh, I just don't have to give, I don't have to give. Well, what if we gave something up? What if we fasted something? Most of us have a coffee habit or a Coke habit or a, or a candy bar habit or a something habit that we could let go of for four weeks and say, God, what would you do with that? If I was not wed to it so strongly, what would you do with that? And God, how could it be meaningful? Because after all, for all that we focus on at Christmas, often it's the grandkids or the great-grandkids or the kids or the spouse or brother, sister, aunt, uncle, somebody we're, we're trying to focus on making it special. And I get that. But after all, whose birthday is Christmas? It's Jesus' birthday. So I encourage you to think about Christmas as Jesus' birthday and putting Jesus at the center of it as we celebrate his birthday all month long and get ready for the Christmas season. So let's think about the promise that Jesus made us and let's begin to think about what we've promised him because most all of us have made, us made some kind of promises. We can't keep them unless he empowers that, but he will empower us to be able to keep our word to him. Amen? 
If you have your Bible in Matthew 13, we're going to continue to talk about this kingdom that was prophesied that would come, a prince of peace, mighty counselor, wonderful everlasting father, to his kingdom there will be no end. And in Matthew, we see the kingdom being declared in pictures and in parables. If you have Matthew 13 found, if you will stand with me, we're going to read a passage of scripture today and talk about a dragnet. And we want to tell you clearly that no one will escape the culminating judgment that is coming of Jesus. Matthew 13, verse 47, Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Let us pray. God, we thank you today, a day that we can stand and open your word. And God, we pray that we would very faithfully, as good stewards of both this opportunity of time and this opportunity in the text of Scripture, to make known the things that are new and old the things that are worthwhile for teaching, the things that are worthwhile for living and knowing that we belong to Jesus. God, we pray today that we, your people, would affirm that we have understood and learned the text of Scripture, but Lord, most of all, that we have applied it to our life. Lord, it is a certainty that no one will escape the culminating and soon coming judgment of Jesus Christ upon our life. And Lord, it will be an eternal mistake to reject Jesus. And Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts and save someone's soul this morning. Amen. And you may be seated. The dragnet. Well, you can't preach a sermon about the dragnet, at least in most places in America, without... Uh, instigating some memory from some who are about my age and older. Some of you will say, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about the dragnet. If you've ever heard of the television show Dragnet, raise your hand, okay? And the rest of you are all children, okay? And you don't know. There was a show that I think ended its run in 1970, so some of you can say that's why I don't know about it. Uh, And the rest of you slept through that decade, I guess, of the 60s, that became famous because it was sort of the first in a genre that most of you would be aware of now, of those law and order style shows. A very serious, somber, but yet entertaining look at how the arm of the law was right and righteous and serious, but at the same time, a stabilizing force in an otherwise out-of-control society. And so you had these monologues that kind of characterized the show in a very serious beginning that would start something like this. One of the monologues was this. This is the city. It was the city of Los Angeles. Two million people. Almost one million kids. The people have tried to plan for these children. They've built schools for them to learn in, parks for them to play in. Most of the kids follow the course as planned. A few of them get lost along the way. When they do, it makes trouble for me. I am a cop. I wear a badge. It was a Thursday. September 15th, it was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch in a burglary division. My partner is Bill Gannon. The boss is Captain Mack. My name is Friday. 
It was 7.30 a.m. We were reporting early for another day. It got started in a hurry. A large quantity of high-velocity gelatin dynamite had been stolen from a consumer storage magazine. We had to try and find it before someone used it. Bum, ba bum, bum. Bum, ba bum, bum. Bum, that's how it would end, okay? Or that's how it would begin. This ominous four-note orchestration of a tympanic drum and a symphony behind it that I found out this week was titled Danger Ahead. That was the title of that tune. Bum, ba bum, bum. Bum, ba bum, bum. Bum. Some of you have never seen Dragnet, but I bet all of you have kind of heard that tune. And then this would be said in every episode, the story you're about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. The title Dragnet became at some point synonymous with how in law enforcement and through good policing, bad guys don't get away with doing wrong. That through the law and through justice and through its proper enforcement, there would be a great seine of a net that would go through society and catch everyone and find the wrongdoers and punish them appropriately. Now we know that in our world, in America, in our culture, in modern day, we have a whole lot of discussion about those kinds of things. And I'm not here today to preach on that other than to say in every worldly society, in every, in every institution that has humans in it, there's going to be a bunch of problems and inequities and they won't always turn out right. That's not an excuse, nor is it a full explanation, but we are flawed in America and everywhere else in our ability to perfectly have a dragnet. But I'm not here today to tell you about American policing or societal stability. What we're here today to do is look in Scripture and with our mind upon a, an idea of what it means for everything to get sifted, if you will, and all wrong to get caught, we find that's not the American ideal. That is God's true plan for the world. So today we say it is Sunday, November 29th, 2020. It was cool this morning in Calhoun. We're attending the early service or the 11 o'clock service, as which it were, at Bethesda. My partners are the brethren at Bethesda Baptist Church, the followers of Jesus. Our boss is God. My name is Wesley. It's 1134, and we're reporting a hit here today for the Lord's Day, and it gets started kind of the same way week after week. The scripture we're about to read is true. None of the names are going to be changed. You just insert your own. Because what God is telling us today is the most important thing that you will ever hear in your entire life. Life. We will not get away from God's dragnet. Number one today, I want us to look at the back part of our scripture first, which is odd. We normally look at the first part first and the second part second. I want us to see that Jesus is talking to his disciples. When Jesus talks about the wheat and the tares and, and, and the leaven and, and the mustard seed, he's, he's primarily talking to his disciples. There are others around who hear, but, but there's a teaching emphasis toward those who are nearest him. And so we see, as we look in verses 49 and 50, 51 and 52, specifically Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he looks to them and he asks them a question and he says, Have you understood all these things. It's an affirmation that we hear back when they say, Yes, Lord. Say that with me. Yes, Lord. Don't we often say that to the Lord about stuff? God says one thing, we say yes. We come next week and God tells us something, we say yes. Well, sometimes, can we just raise our hand and admit, <laughs> I'll raise mine, hey, 
Sometimes we just get in the habit of saying, yes, Lord, kind of like, yes, dear. I'm married. I know how that can go sometimes. I've been guilty of saying, yes, dear, and I didn't even hear what the question was. I just knew that was the right answer. <laughs> yes, dear. An affirmation. Did you hear me? Yes. Are you going to do it? Yes. See, Jesus, in a sense, is giving his disciples a, a type of a final exam. Now, I say that, and I said in the early service, I'll say it again, most people don't even know what a final exam is anymore. I don't know when this began to happen because I'm at that age where everything was the other day. Okay, when I was younger, it was a year ago, two years ago, a month ago. Now that I'm as old as I am, which is somewhere in the middle, I guess, 48, um, it's the other day. Just the other day, schools stopped giving final exams. Now, that might have been five years ago or 15 years ago. I have no idea when it was. But mostly, if you make a decent grade and you don't lay out of school all the time, you can exempt your final exam. Some of the people, my younger guys and gals in the early service were back there saying, yeah, I'm like, have you ever taken a final exam? They're like, no, we don't ever take those. I was like, well, how do you know if you learned anything if you don't take a final exam? I think it's just less papers to grade and less studying to do. But Jesus gave a final exam. He gave many. This one was answerable in two words. Have you understood all these things? And his disciples said, yes, Lord. Well, what happens after completing the final exam? Well, we go to graduation. We, we move on, we, we go from one year to the next, where it's freshman to sophomore, sophomore to junior, junior to senior, or senior, so I don't know what it is think, seniors think they're going to do, but they think they're going to graduate toward freedom. Anybody remember getting out of high school? Freedom. But yeah. <laughs> you have it made when you're in high school, and everybody who's not in high school says, yes, we did. Freedom. We're going to graduate to some next level of not having anybody to report to and no threat of any, well, not final exams, but homework or anything. We don't have to worry about it. Well, listen, the reality is, is we do graduate in life. We can come out of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. Some of you go to college, and some of you get out of college, and some go back and get graduate degrees, and some get out of that, and some get in the workforce, and some get promotions, and some retire. I know some are, oh, I just can't wait to retirement. What are you going to do then? I don't know, but it's going to be great. Freedom. <laughs> and then your wife had your list of things to do. Mile long. Listen, don't live our lives looking for that day of freedom. Because what we're going to find is God is not interested in us having freedom away from him he's looking for us to have freedom inside of his will which means when we're in elementary school we have freedom when we're in high school we have freedom when we're in college we have freedom if you're in the workforce you have freedom if you're the leader in the workforce you have freedom freedom to be who God has called you to be some years ago there was another movie out this will be movie day at the church and I, I can't remember exactly maybe this was the name of it bucket list I remember that came out everybody had a bucket list after this movie everybody said I've got this list of things that I want to do this place I want to go this adventure I want to have this hobby I've never fulfilled and listen it's fine to have a list of things you want to do before you die <laughs> but don't wait till you're almost dead before you start trying to do your list Go ahead and start now being who God has called you to be, doing what God has called you to do, and don't wait on the day of graduation to one day say, well, now I'm going to try to do it all and do it in a day or two. Jesus was taking these men that he found in the fields and the fishing villages, and he's teaching them what it means to live in a kingdom that is everywhere, a kingdom that goes all the way, a kingdom that is high enough that it reaches above every obstacle in life, and a kingdom that if they understand its teaching will change their responsibility in the history of the world. And he says, do you understand all these things? And they say, yes, we do. He said, well, good. Therefore, when Jesus says, therefore, you know, we just shifted gears, by the way. Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder 
who brings out of his treasure things old and new. Another parable, if you will, inside of a parable. An illustration, a simile about what it's like to say, I've graduated. Now in this room here and, and on the internet and in the parking lot, there are people, if I would ask you, do you follow Jesus? Are you a believer in Jesus? Many would say yes. Some would say no. But right now I'm talking to those who say yes. You are a pupil. You are a student of Christ. And as you are following Christ, as a student of Christ, and Jesus says, have you understood? And you say, yeah, I kind of understand that. Good. You graduated. You've climbed one more rung on the ladder. You've taken one more step of ascension to say, I have this understanding. Now, what does Jesus require of me? I'm glad you asked. He looks at you like the head of a household like one who has stewardship responsibilities over the assets of the household. And one of those great assets of the household is its treasury or its pantry and the resources are there and to properly take them and to distribute them to all the children, all the other servants, all the people who live around the house as each one has needs. You are the steward to give and to distribute all the resources in a way that will benefit everybody around you. And you know what? If you look around your house, if you look around your school, if you look around where you live, there are people everywhere that are needing something. And Jesus says you will properly know how to distribute the things that are both old and new. See, some people think Jesus came and he just tore down everything old. No, Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't destroy the law. He built on the foundation that had begun. He did not tear it down. He is our hope and eternal life, and there's not going to be another one. So we take what was good and what was true, and Jesus fulfilled it and completed it in every way. Now, you say, well, what does it mean to, to, to keep track of things old and new? I'm glad you asked that. When I was younger, I grew up on a farm. And when you grow up on a farm, you don't have a job. That's just life, okay? So I grew up picking up rocks and digging up weeds and fixing fences and you get paid for none of that when you grow up on a farm. And I learned a long time, if you ask about it, you just get told you get to live here and you get to eat here. That's kind of your pay when you grow up on a farm. And so as young as I could, I remember I wanted a job because I thought jobs paid. I found out they don't pay much, but they do pay, which was better, okay? And so as soon as I was old enough to get a, a job, I got a job at a restaurant in town, a fast food restaurant. And I thought that was great because I worked, same as I did on a farm, and at the end of, I think it was two weeks, at the end of two weeks, they would give you a check. And I kind of liked that because a check was as good as money, I found out, and you could take it out of the bank and you could use that for stuff. And so I didn't much mind what I did because I was used to work, but I found out that every week a truck came in and they offloaded the food that we sold. And there were two places, we would, well, there were three places. One was dry goods and it was just a room, like a pantry. And the other two was a cooler, a walk-in cooler, and the other was a big freezer. And so when they would offload this truck, I would volunteer for freezer or cooler duty, okay, because I have always been hot-natured, and I love that. And so they'd back up this big tractor trailer, and they would open the door, and they had one of these things that had these little caster wheels on it, and it would zoom, and it would slide. And I was, felt like I was on another show, TV. Remember Lucy when they had the pies coming down or whatever? Well, this was reversed. They weren't the food was coming in and not going out. And so in these big boxes, this food would come off this trailer and down these rollers, and we would catch it, and we would put it in the cooler of the freezer. And the freezer was even better because it was like 49,000 degrees below zero in there, and I was always hot. So it was nice. And so you'd have a stack of potato cakes here in a box from two weeks ago, and here'd come another one. Whoosh, you'd catch it. Boom, you put it there. And here'd come another one. you catch it, and you stack up potato cakes, and then you go to turnovers over here, little cherry pastry things, and, and you just stack them up. So the next week would come, and as you went through the week, you'd use them from the top down. That's what I thought. And so they'd shoot you some more, and you'd put some more on here. And after about a month, the, the boss came in one day. He said, I think you're doing something wrong. And I'm like, no, this shoots out. We catch it. We stack it. That's kind of how this works, isn't it? He's like, well, yeah, sort of. He said, but are you rotating your stock? And I said, rotating the what? Again, I grew up on a farm. I thought stock was like livestock. I didn't see any cattle in there, so I wasn't sure how to rotate them. He said, well, no, it's the inventory. He said, and when this stuff comes, you got to make a hole. You put the newest stuff on the bottom and the next oldest stuff there and the oldest stuff on top. So the next time somebody needs some potato cakes, they come in, they get the oldest box of potato cakes, 
because we don't want somebody to come in here 10 years from now and get a 10-year-old box of potato cakes that's been on the bottom of the whole time and then get tomain poisoning or something like that and be in the hospital, okay? So we, we had to rotate the stock so that you serve the older stuff before it got old. Now, I'm telling you all that to say this. I had to learn how to steward the resources. Jesus says to these fishermen, you can't let the stock get old. You can't let the, the resources get stale. He said, it's your responsibility not to just try to have a storehouse. We're not collecting the world's oldest potato cakes. We're not just trying to see if we can maintain in the kingdom. If we can just hold on to what God's given us, we're wanting to reach out and distribute. It's not given to us just to store up. It's given to us to give away. And he tells them that they have affirmed the teaching, graduated, and his expectation is that they will have a larger responsibility in the kingdom to keep giving away what God has given them. That doesn't mean we don't enjoy it ourselves. That doesn't mean we have no responsibility to receive it and to apply it to our own life. But God is giving us these things in order to benefit us, yes, but also to benefit the world. Now, that's the latter part of the text for today. What was so important about this affirmation to graduate and to have this time of expectation in this pastor scripture? I'm glad you asked because now we're going back to the first part. Jesus speaks about all the people. See, specifically what Jesus was asking his pupils, his learners, to apply and to be able to give away was this understanding of the dragnet. That the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Goes through the water and it catches everything. Jesus used at least three different usage of the word fishing in his ministry. One time he told one of his disciples who owed some taxes and was worried about it, go get a line and a hook and some bait. Go throw it in the water, catch a fish, and in the fish's mouth will be a gold coin. Use that and pay your taxes. And some of you said, that's why I came to church today. I needed that truth, right? Well, listen, he didn't tell us all we can go do that. He told one disciple to do that. But Jesus said, sometimes we fish, and we fish with a line and a hook. But Jesus also told all of his disciples when he called them to be fishers of men that they would fish with a throw net. Some of you have been to a place where you've seen something like that or maybe on television You've seen something like this. I've been on a vacation a couple times. We've gone fishing. I don't like deep sea fishing. I like to be able to see the bottom and the shore from where I am. And if it gets far away, I don't like it too much. But one time we were just fishing in a bay, and we were on a boat with these guys. It was a small boat. He said, we need some bait. And I said, well, what, where are we going to get some bait? Because when I was young, we did go down to the corner store here in Red Bud, and they'd have some night crawlers in a box over there, some crickets. Or if I was at the house and I was even younger, we'd just go under Mama's forsythia bush in the corner and we'd pull it up and we'd start digging and we'd find some earthworms there, just common worms. That's what we would do. But this guy said, no, we're going to get our bait right out here. So he just took a net and he saw a little school of shiners or something like this, what I'd call them, and he threw it out there. And this guy had such dexterity and his weight, his net was so weighted that on the periphery of this net there were weights. And it had a cord that ran through it, and he had enough skill that he held onto a rope, and he threw it, and it spread out, and these weights fanned out, and it landed in the pool of fish, and the weights made it cascade down like a parachute, and he pulls on this rope real quick, and he just gathers up all these little kind of minnow-like fish, and he pulls them in, and he throws them in his little live well, and that's our, our bait, and we go fish. And Jesus told his disciples they would be fishers of men. And when he talks about that, that's the wording there, is a throw net fisherman where we learn to fish for others in Jesus' name, just like that. But in this passage of Scripture, there's a third terminology for fishing net that Jesus uses, which is different than the hook and the line, and is different than the throw net. It's a seine, the Greek word we would use for a seine, like a net with floats across the top. And weights across the bottom that it's not circular, it's linear. And it's upright in the water. Floats up here, weights on the bottom, and a full net from top to bottom, like a curtain in the water. And oftentimes these nets would be about a half a mile long. One end often on the shoreline anchored, the other in the boat, and they would row or sail outward into the current and into the sea, trailing the net behind them, just putting it off behind them establishing a curtain in the water. 
a wall of net, if you will. And when they got to the extent of the limit of their net and its length, they would stop. And then they would make a calculated move to arc back around toward the shore. Some of you are seeing in your mind what's about to happen. And they are encapsulating everything in the ocean on the other side of their net. And they're making a big arc as they go all the way back to the shoreline. And then everything that is inside of that encapsulated area is now trapped by that net. And so slowly they would make the fullness of the circle on the shoreline and they would pull the net together. And so now a complete curtain in a circle in the water all the way from top to bottom, everything inside is now captured and now it's just a matter of time and how long it will take to retrieve the net very steadily, very slowly as not to tear the net and lose any of its contents. For inside that contents are the day's pay. <laughs> are the reward of fishing, very valuable fish, very lively fish, fish that people will pay good money for. And they take their care and they bring them all to shore. And now as they do that, they look inside the net, and yes, there's the day's pay, but also there's a lot of waste. There's pieces of wood, old rocks, abandoned shells, Dead fish, seaweed, all kinds of stuff. fish that are alive but nobody wants. <laughs> and the Bible tells us that as they gathered this net, some of every kind are in it. And it was full. And they drew it to shore and they sat down and they put in vessels. They'd have big live well type vessels where the live fish would go right in there. They didn't want to kill them immediately. They didn't have ice. They'd put them over here and they'd still be alive, some of them would be. They'd be getting the valuable fish and sorting the kinds of fish, but over here the dead fish and the rocks and the shells and all the stuff that's no good. Sorting out these fish. Say, so, well, that's pretty interesting. I never thought about it that way. Well, verse 49 is the important part. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and separate the wicked from the just and cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Pupils of God, those of you who said just moments ago, yes, we understand all of it. Jesus wanted them to understand in this final exam, their graduation, the greater responsibility, that the, all of what they understood was the most important thing that anybody could ever understand, and that is this. No one escapes the culminating gathering judgment of God. Some people mistakenly say that the dragnet parable is essentially just like the wheat and the tares. No, the wheat and the tares offers hope. The wheat and the tares says we're still letting it grow. We're still letting it go. We're going to let it go. One day there'll be a judgment, but the parable of the dragnet says this, the judgment is coming, and the judgment is final. There is no insinuation, if you will, of hope in the parable of the dragnet. There's no desire to let it linger and let it wake. There is this ominous understanding that time is culminating and the end is near and the curtain is drawing. And we say, yes, we understand. And yet we live in a world that seems like everybody believes we're going to get a do-over and we can hold open opportunity to some other time later in the future. But this parable says that time is culminating and opportunity is waning right now. There's a culmination of temporal life, at the end of which will be an evaluation of everything about who we are spiritually in Christ. He says the angels will come and they'll participate in this sorting. This sifting has happened, and nobody escapes it. There's no fish that get through. See, sometimes we preach these parables. I think some people think, I'm just going to ignore that. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm good seed or bad seed. I don't know if I'm a wheat or a tar. I'm not really interested. I don't want to be in the tree. I'm not going to let leaven of the grace get in my life. I'm just going to say no to all of it. Here's what we need to know. People can ignore the gospel, but the kingdom is in effect no matter what. 
The kingdom is like a net that is drawing and it's gathering and it's coming and it's closer and it's closer and it's closer. And people may ignore it, but it doesn't make it not true. It's true. And we as the pupils say we understand and we've got to start living like it's real because it is real. And there's a gathering, and there's a sifting taking place now, and there'll be a sorting taking place in all of eternity, the angels being a part of it. And it says they're looking and casting some into fire, and there'll be a wailing and gnashing of teeth and separating some to eternal reward. They're making a difference between the just and the unjust. Those who have Jesus and those who do not, there's an evaluation taking place. God is looking at our lives. He's looking at their lives. One of the saddest things that I find about this time of quarantine we're in is some sort of weird theological notion that Christians seem to have. I'm not casting any dispersion on whatever you're deciding about where you're going or what you're doing. That's not my intent this morning. But it is my intent to make this very clear from God's Word. This past week, we had Thanksgiving. And one of the things that I want to illustrate this by is something I do every year is we go to several places, too much food and too little time. And so one of the things that we like to do is a takeout plate. I believe Jesus invented takeout plates. You say, I don't believe that. Read the feeding of the 5,000. They had 12 baskets full at the end. Jesus invented takeout plates. And so it's all right. I used to try to eat it all while I was there. Now I just eat as much as I can and I put the rest in a box to go. And specifically, my, I've got great cooks all in my family. I'll make somebody mad in just a minute. I won't be trying. My mother-in-law has, makes very, very good pecan pie. And I learned a long time, I love desserts, but if it's Thanksgiving, there's dressing and cranberry, I'm going to just get the main stuff. And, and if I don't have room, I'm going to take the pecan pie home with me. And so I'll go over there near the end of the day, and I'll get me a wedge or two of Mom-in-law Donna's pecan pie, and I'll put that in a plate, and I'll cover that plate up, and I'll take that home. And then maybe that night with a cup of coffee, or maybe if I'm still kind of, as we say in the South, letting it settle, if I'm still letting it settle that night, I maybe wait till tomorrow night. Or, you know, because pecan pie does not go bad, okay? It's just good for a while. And so I wait till an opportune moment to enjoy properly the way pecan pie ought to taste, knowing that I have preserved that, put it in the refrigerator, it's going to be good tonight, it'll be good tomorrow, it'll be good the next day, it's going to be good. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be good. All right? Now, see, that's true of pecan pie. I, I'm not castigating, I'm not calling into question anybody's quarantine or anything you're doing, but here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want us to understand, even here. We're not playing games, <laughs> in God's house tonight. What works with pecan pie does not work with life. We cannot segment away an hour or a day or a week or a month or a year. We cannot encapsulate it. We cannot contain it. We cannot refrigerate it. We cannot preserve it. We cannot set it aside. We cannot call it back next week. We cannot call it back tomorrow or next year and say, I'll have some of that now. We cannot do that because time is drawing to an end. There is a net that is in this world. The kingdom is like a net. It has been drawn out by God. It is being drawn in by God and we have no ability to postpone or pause where we are in this kingdom at this moment. And the church in America, in the world right now, must stand up and say, yes, Lord, we get it. There is a culmination of the kingdom. And people are living and dying and going to hell now. Now. And we get it because in this evaluation there will be a separation that is eternal. And there are people dying today and tomorrow and the next day that are not dying of something we are quarantined over or for. And some who are dying of something we are quarantined over and for. But it doesn't matter. 
in that there is still a judgment that is coming, and the judgment is not how we die or when we die. The judgment is do we die in Christ or do we die in our flesh? The angels will come and there'll be a sorting taking place. And right now we're counting everything COVID, not COVID, COVID, not COVID. And I'm not, I'm not being smart aleck today. I love you. But what I want you to know is there will be no eternal COVID count. There won't. There won't be a COVID cancer count, an eternal cancer count. There will not be an eternal vehicular homicide account. The accounting will be just unjust. Christ, no Christ. Born again, lost in their trespasses and sin. That's right, preacher, I'm saved. Jesus didn't end his teaching in today's text with, now bow your head, now close your eyes, let's sing just as I am. That's not how he ended his teaching. He turned to his pupils, his followers, those that he knew all but one at this point in time, Judas, the exclusion, that they were all born again. He said, do you understand all these things? And his believers, his followers, his pupils said, yes, Lord. So the question, I think, for the church in our day and time now, as it has been in every day and time, is do we understand that life is drawing to an end? Time is sweet and short, and death comes suddenly and then suddenly. So many people with so many things yet to do. So many endeavoring to set apart a time in their life now and put it off for a time later. To be better utilized, better experienced. As a net. As an eternal tourniquet of sorts. Draws closer and closer and closer. Until it constricts in such a way that all the fish that used to swim, occasionally fluttering a fin against the boundary of life's great sane, that wall of the constriction of God's wrath and God's opportunity, God's justice and his mercy, we would flutter back over into the depths. <laughs> flutter back over where there's more space, but what we find as life narrows in is the space is going away. To all of a sudden, in a claustrophobic moment of panic as time and life ends, we say, where did it go? <laughs> where did it go? Those who desired and, and thought about swimming in the depths of the world and all the opportunities it afforded now find themselves languishing in the shallows, beginning to suffocate in the tide pool of opportunity that has now retreated. Now is the time. Now is our opportunity. Now. The separation's coming. John MacArthur says it this way, there's no way in the world we would believe in hell if Jesus wasn't the one who taught us about it. We cannot even conceive of eternal damnation. And it had to be our Lord who said this or we would have never been able to accept it. It was his own special emphasis if you have something, you can jot it down. Matthew 5, 22, Jesus said, Whoever then says thou fool should be in danger of hellfire. I don't like preaching on hell, but I feel more like Jesus when I preach on hell because Jesus preached on hell continually. Verse 29 of Matthew 5, he says, If your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you than one of your members should perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Verse 30, If your right hand offends you, throw it away. It's profitable for you to be, uh, should, it is more profitable for you for, to lose a member than your whole body be cast into hell twice in one passage. Chapter 7, the rain descended, the flood came, and the house fell, and great was its fall. 
Chapter 11 of Matthew, verse 20, he began to upbraid the cities, and his mighty works were done there. But they did not repent. And he said to them, you will be brought down to hell. Jesus, over and over and over again, and Matthew says, hell is real, hell is hot, hell is eternal, and hell is a place you can miss, but you have to know Jesus. But hell is a place you will find. So the story we read today is true. The names therein are ours. We will not be protected if we are found guilty. We will be protected if we are found innocent in the name of Jesus Christ. The television show Dragnet had a famous line, the facts, ma'am, just the facts. The great investigator wanted to get down to the heart of the matter. Let's leave out all the other stuff. It's the facts. Just the facts. Hey, preacher, can't you find something more fun to preach on between Thanksgiving and Christmas? It's just the facts. These are just the facts. There's a culminating judgment coming, and we will not escape it because Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And if we know him, we'll be found as right and just, saved, born again, and rewarded in eternity. And if we've rejected him, he knows the difference. The question is, have we learned all this? I pray the answer is yes, Lord. Let's live like it. We have neighbors and friends and family that cannot afford another holiday season of our passivity in the direction and concerning their relationship with Jesus. If we know him, they need to know we know him. And they need to know that they need to know him because that is the most important thing of all eternity in every life in the world. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and we will have a time of invitation. Lord, we ask you right now to examine us, find us, each one, Lord, whether or not we are saved or lost. And for those who listen right now, God, there are many who do not know you. And this is your will that none should perish, but all come to know you. And God, right now, if they will believe in their heart, say, God, I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of your glory. I want to be saved. I need you to come save me. I need you to come into my life. I believe that you want to. I believe you can because I believe you did it all. I believe you lived without sin. I believe you died in my place. Lord, I believe you rose from the grave. And God, I believe you're in heaven now calling to me. Come home. Sinner, come home. Lord, save me. Someone needs to pray that prayer right now. Lord, save me. And even while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, these altars are open for someone to slip out of their seat and to come and kneel in this altar and pray. Say, Lord, save me. I don't want eternity in hell. I want eternity in heaven. I want to live for you. Lord, there's a room full of pupils, <laughs> your students, and God, it's time for us to graduate from learner to leader, from one who receives to one who distributes the truth of the kingdom. God, that we would be vessels that you could flow into and out of into this world. God, that we'd be not stingy with what we know and who we know, but God, that we'd be liberal to point out that you are not a new God. You are the same God from yesterday, today, and forever. You are the one who never changes. You are the completion of the law. And God, you are our one true foundation. God, we pray that we would say yes, Lord, and mean it, Lord, and we would live it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we are worshipful, we're going to sing just come just as you are. And we mean that for you to come. And these altars are open. As God is speaking to you, you respond. And let's do what God's called us to do for salvation, for prayer. You come on this first note.
Most people said amen. amen. It's been great today to be in the Lord's house, and we're so glad that each one of you are here. We invite you to be back tonight. We encourage you to come at 5. Uh, church leadership, there's church council at 5. There's also uh, our Sunday prayer time, which started back this month, and we are having that today at 5 as well. And then tonight at 6 o'clock is our evening worship, and we'll be taking our next text uh, this evening, and we'll be seeing how Jesus defied expectations of what he would do in his wisdom and his works of miracles, even in his hometown. So you come and be back tonight and be a part of our worship together. On Tuesday, there's a deacon's meeting. On Saturday is Go Ministries, where we take and prepare 125 meals and distribute them in the Golden Circle and Hill House communities in our in our. Uh, neighborhood of Calhoun and so come be a part of those opportunities this week and tell someone that you miss them and check on somebody if you haven't heard from them in a while we encourage you to do that as well the angel tree gifts are due back on December the 20th and there are still approximately three over here if you want to grab one before you leave does anyone have any other uh, announcements I know Sunday school materials in the other building I think most of you got that if you were here at Sunday school time, if for some reason we didn't have enough for you, we did lower our regular um, order because of the COVID. That we've not had as many people in Sunday school, and so we don't want to be poor stewards. If you didn't have enough literature, we also don't want you to be deprived. So if you let Brian and Marty know, we will get you what you need for your Sunday school literature. I also want to ask a uh, special prayer and give a special praise. We've been praying for Tristan, who comes on Wednesdays to our church, who was burned in a grease fire last week, and he is doing much better. His skin grafts are taking and, and, and growing, and that is great. Uh, so continue to pray for him. We're also praying, and I have not heard an update this morning on Destiny Calder, but she was, doing, uh, she was having a very tough day yesterday, and I got a couple of mixed possibilities. What they know is, is that she, gave, she was given blood earlier yesterday, and there was worry that either she has an infection in her blood or a reaction to the blood they were giving, but uh, she was having some major complications yesterday evening, and a prayer uh, went out among the church. And so uh, let's continue to pray for destiny. I don't have a better update to give you other than I know we just need to be praying for her. Okay. Does anyone else have a, an announcement or anything that we're forgetting? Wednesday night services are back on schedule this week, so we're looking forward to that. We've been having a great time on Wednesday, so we encourage you to come and invite others to come and be a part of what God is doing on Wednesdays. May God bless you and keep you. If you need a Bible study group, if you're here and don't feel comfortable in a small group, uh, we can get you in touch with some of those who are online. If you're online and need help getting in touch with somebody that's online in Bible study, if you'll let us know, we'll help them help you do that, or if you are interested in in-person Bible study on Wednesdays, we have an adult study for ladies that happens in here, and in the other room behind us, there is a men's group that meets, and we have classes for all ages from birth to wherever you are in life. There's a place for you on Wednesdays, okay? May God bless you and keep you is my prayer, and if I'm forgetting something, I apologize, but we'll be dismissed. Love you, Sister Selena, for helping us usher out. <laughs>